Susan's writing about this. Her latest piece for The New Yorker is titled The Senate's False Hope of a Grand Bargain Meets Its Trumpy Demise. So, Susan, it sounds like you've written off the legislation. Uh, I think James Lankford and Chris Murphy and Kirsten Cinema would say there's still a little bit of life left here, maybe not in the House, but they hope in the Senate. Um, what is the level of frustration from that Senate group that has worked in good faith and in a bipartisan way and very seriously for a long time to craft this bill when they hear every Republican in the House effectively, not every, but most of them saying this is dead on arrival? Well, that's right. Listening to Donald Trump and essentially Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, acting as Trump's proxy this week, coming out, giving his first speech on the floor, substantive speech on the floor about this very issue, calling it essentially madness, a bill that hasn't even been released yet. Uh, you know, I do think you're seeing sort of the last gasp of the Republican establishment in the Senate, you know, sort of throw up its hands and say, you know, I don't know what we can do to move forward. Langford is as conservative as they come. Uh, you know, he and Mitch McConnell seem to have really thought that there was a, a, a chance here to come up with a deal and that Joe Biden might be willing to take a deal, by the way, a border deal that no, at no other moment would a Democratic president consider it except for in this political context. And so what I'm hearing from senators, uh, you know, is this is a moment and somehow Donald Trump wants us to squander this political moment in the name of hitching our entire party to his political fortunes. And by the way, the Ukraine thing, this is as significant as it comes. We have taken the single most toxic issue in American politics, the border, which has defied bipartisan solutions for years, and now hitched the fight of Ukraine in its existential fight with Russia, is now held hostage to the toxic American politics of the border. So it seems like a kind of a political tragedy all around. Susan, uh, you recall, of course, that it was the House Republicans who wanted to tie the two together uh, and who wanted to, who wanted to, to make that Gordian knot that, that, that can't be undone now. And and looks like Ukraine aid might also be imperiled. It, it, is there anything, do you think, that will move Speaker Johnson? Because in, in the end, he's the, he's the big obstacle. He won't bring it to the floor, theoretically, there could be a discharge petition or something like that. But is there anything that could that could move him? Uh, do you think to at least bring it to the floor, where where it probably could pass? Well, that's right, Gene. I think that you know the sort of uh, supporters of Ukraine, uh, they see the the hopes at this point is that. If the Republicans in the House are not going to go ahead with uh, the grand bargain, the border and Ukraine, is there a chance to have a separate vote on Ukraine? You saw Mitch McConnell suggesting earlier this week that that's exactly where this thing is going to head. Now, Biden has asked for $60 billion additionally for Ukraine. Uh, you know, there's a widespread sense that uh, even if there is a separate vote, that they're unlikely to get the full $60 billion that you could see Republicans extracting uh, as a price for that, the, a refusal to give uh, the non-military part of that assistance package to Ukraine. But, uh, you know, there's still a hope, certainly in national security quarters and people I talk to uh, inside the administration, that there can somehow be a way forward for Ukraine aid. But, uh, you know, I talked to one senator this week, Gene Angus King from Maine. He said, if we don't do this for Ukraine, it will be the biggest foreign policy mistake that the United States has made in 50 years. I do think the stakes are really high on this one. But is it even imaginable that you have uh, Republicans, the right wing, that in effect are giving a victory to Putin? I mean, uh, maybe I missed something, but we used to say we wanted to make sure Russia did not expand, uh, that NATO was secure. And now we are saying that uh, we are having right wing Republicans, not, you know, so-called uh, communist sympathizing left wing Democrats that are saying, let Putin do what he want. We don't care if Ukraine goes down. I mean, how do we even fix this in our minds politically that we've shifted so other than to say this is where Trump has brought the Republican Party? Yeah, I think that uh, it is a, a direct consequence of Donald Trump's continued dominance over the Republican Party. I mean, if Trump 
wins in November. This is the scenario that, that Putin is keeping fighting for. He has zero incentive to end the war before November. He has zero incentive uh, to have any kind of a, a negotiated settlement, certainly with Ukraine, because there's the very real prospect that if Trump comes to power, not only would he uh, not continue U.S. assistance to Ukraine. Remember, he's been a skeptic of it all along, uh, but he he's a skeptic of NATO itself. And uh, I think people should be very clear that that is a very likely consequence of Trump uh, if you were to win power again in November. Very uh, fair. And Jonathan